You're oh, Chris? I'm sorry. I don't see Chris. Oh, wait, we're live now. So. Oh. You're right. I don't see I Mr. Tory, and I don't see Mr. Stanton. All right. Well, we're live. <laughs> so uh, okay. why don't we just call this meeting to order? Uh, this is the Public Works uh, Committee of the Common Council, Tuesday, February 1st. It is, it is 7.01. Um, and uh, first order business is roll call. We have Tom Livingston, Lisa Shanahan, Tom Keegan. Um, we have Darlene Young, Dominique Johnson. Did I miss anyone? Oh, and uh, Nora Nijelski Eichner um, on the committee. And we also have with us um, Diana Revolus, who is not on the committee, but joining us tonight. Um, before we move on to the first order of business, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge the great work of the public works staff um, uh, during the snowstorm on Saturday. Um, I've been on this committee for two years now, and you know, be, one thing or another, particularly COVID, um, has uh, made it difficult to get down to, you know, see the operations and see what's going on. But I want to. Thank Mr. Keegan for picking me up in his big, big uh, Jeep <laughs> with four wheel drive um, and getting me down to the operations center. Um, I don't see Mr. Tory yet. I want to thank him for the tour um, of the garage and all the facilities. And uh, of course, Mr. Carr, you know, just for running a really tight ship and uh, also for arranging for us. Um, I was able to, and, and Mr. Livingston as well, um, to do a ride along with uh, one of the city plows and that was quite an experience. So I wanted to thank Brian, my plow driver and Bob, the supervisor who came by and helped me climb into the truck. It was, um, it was, it was just a really great experience. And, you know, I, I've seen, you know, for years, what a great job Public Works does, what a great job the snow crew does, you know, just driving around after a storm, but it was a wonderful experience to see how hard you're working, um, what a great job you're doing firsthand. So um, just wanted to thank you for that. And, and then, I know Mr. Livingston would like to. Yeah, I, I, I wanna echo that because, you know, it, it's, I've been on the committee for seven, almost coming on seven years now, and I have never done a ride along and I did a ride along this last weekend. And I had to tell you, um, this is, one of the, the biggest thing residents see and complain about, or used to complain about, were how we plow the snow, how we how we take care of it. And I got to tell you, I I, I had the, was fortunate to ride with a driver by the name of Fred Devia. I think that right with his form and met his foreman Jose Ortiz. More professional people you can ask for. Um, you know, and there are a couple of things I just want to mention because it just really struck me. Uh, I rode around for with him for a while. And the care and, and attention to detail that, that Freddie put into this were just remarkable. I mean, he knew this route. He knew the kids on the route. He knew where they, how long they'd been there. And one thing that struck me, we were going, I was talking to him about, you know, you know, plowing, always plowed on the side with the traffic generally. And in one street he was going down and he was plowing on the other side. And I said to him, why are you, why is this different? And he said, it's different because this side has driveways, the other doesn't. So he was moving the taking extraordinary care to move the snow away from the driveways wherever he could. And he did that the whole route. I mean, it was amazing. And as I said, this is what residents see. And, and I am so proud of you guys. I'm so thankful that we have you guys doing it because you do such a tremendous job. And it's just remarkable. And so thank you for all your hard work. Thank you for your staff. It's just a great team. And Anthony, you, you thank you very job. much. You're proud of them. Really much great. appreciated. I'm so thank glad you. I did it. I mean, it's so great. Glad you had a good time. It. I should add one thing um, with when I was in the plow with Brian, we drove around quite a while before he could find a street that really needed to be plowed because the team had done such a good job already, uh, you know, one step ahead of him. So, um, so it was great. <laughs> and, and, and lastly, I think I may have mentioned before, you know, the technology in these trucks, and we've talked about this for years, is amazing. I mean, as I don't know if anybody ever knows this, but they know that operations, and Chris isn't here, I guess, but they know where every truck is, where it's been, how much salt it's putting down, how much sand, speed it's going. And it's amazing. And then you watch the guy, the guys there with a little remote, a little controller in their hands as they're driving, plowing, directing. It's, it's really something. I recommend it. I, I don't want to overburden the staff with a bunch of council people riding, but it's worth it. <laughs> sure is. Thank you. Can I just say something? I, 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 sure. I, I just have to... Um, 
you know, we had former council members who, 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 who took advantage of, I think, the same opportunity and had the same praise um, for DPW staff. And I think it's, it's, it's one of the, it should be one of the requirements for leadership or whoever is a part of, of the heading this committee moving forward. I think forever, because you get a very different perspective on the work that needs to be done, that gets done every day in the city and that folks wanna complain about, but they don't know all the intricacies of how DPW does their job. Um, so I commend you two for doing that. And I, think, I, I, and I think this is something that needs to continue because we sit on the other side and we talk about things, but when you can actually experience what um, the workers are going through um, and how well we do our job as a city, um, it's a very different experience. So I'm happy to hear that the two of you have done it. Um, I'd like to raise my hand to do it, but again, I won't. Um, you know what, I don't think we want to overburden you all, but I think it's a really fantastic thing because you guys seem very um, um, happy about having that experience. So thank you for doing it and sharing it. You know, it, it's just such a learning experience. I, I also have to say, you know, I, I sit on the WPCA, um, Water Pollution Control Authority, and, and that's all new to me. And um, Ralph Kolb was at the Operations Center on Saturday, and he went through every aspect of the digital screen that shows the um, the actual process that all the water goes through before it is released into the river, which was just, you know, terrific. And again, something that, you know, uh, getting a tour of the water pollution, uh, the plant, um, you know, that's something that is um, number one on my agenda. So um, just a great staff, great team you have there, Anthony. Uh, Mr. Keegan, Thank you have something? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I was just gonna say after a weekend of plowing snow, we had a, an unusual circumstance present itself this morning and I, I reached out to uh, Chris Torrey and asked for some help. And he and uh, Chief Carr's guys uh, went out and, and they were able to assist uh, one of uh, my constituents in District D. And I just wanna, again, publicly thank Chief Carr and the whole team. I mean, there's a reason why we could call them public works because they do work uh, real, real hard for, for us. And, and uh, there are public works and I'm very proud to uh, be a small part of it, Chief. And uh, kudos to you and your team. It, they, they are just the greatest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's get on with this meeting. Yeah. Uh, uh, the first um, item on the agenda is public input. Um, I do believe we have Ms. Laura Cella with her hand raised. Um, if we could move her over. Can I just, uh, um, who's with us from IT tonight? Oh, there's, okay, Thank, thanks. Oh, I just saw. Ms. Laura Cella, and then she went away. Thank, thank, thank you. It, it's the last, okay. last time. Great. Thank you, thank you for for uh, raising this. Uh, the uh, snow plowing praise, well deserved. Um, good evening. My name is Diane Laura Cella. I just had a couple of uh, a few quick things before your meeting begins. Uh, I just learned I do not have COVID. It, I have the flu, so I'm very happy to say that. Um, uh, here's my first, uh, I wanted to just, uh, ask, ask for a correction of the minutes. I understand why it was misconstrued. It is win waste, W I N in capital, um, letters, not wind waste. And it was my articulation that pro and the recording. So I just wanted to offer that for a correction in the minutes, as far as that goes, uh, number five on your list. I wanted to lift up and uh, hope and advocate that you approve the National Fish and Wildlife Five Star Urban Waters Restoration. I uh, uh, have uh, participated in those types of grants before in my work on the Norwalk River years ago and the involvement of, of Housatonic 
uh, to uh, the H2H and, and NRWA and all of uh, Tree Alliance, it's terrific. And I really think it'll be a terrific program. Lastly, I wanted to uh, state that I am very happy that HelpSee is uh, going to be engaged. I'm in, uh, in my uh, two years ago in February, 2020, made a presentation with a, an ad hoc Norwalk Zero Waste committee that I uh, still head up and we had asked for a textile uh, curbside program, um, simple uh, recycling uh, stopped operating at the time due to COVID, they are back in Connecticut. However, I think Helpsy has a better model. I just ask that we consider not making it a pilot program because uh, the city of Stanford has been doing this and they are larger than we are. And they've also done work in Cambridge and Boston. So I think they're a proven entity I think that we have to spend more time on environmental education and I and others I know would love to help Jessica and others get the word out in a much more robust way than just the website. Um, so I, I would just ask that you consider that it not be a pilot program, but we roll it out maybe district by district, perhaps to make it more manageable. But I am, I am one that feels that pilot programs are only needed when they are new uh, new technologies or unusual um, situations. People have been throwing their clothes either in a dumpster or in a donation for a long time. I, th I don't think this would be a big ask of the public. I think they can handle a more robust program because we are in a waste crisis. And lastly, it will eventually it will save money for the city of Norwalk and the taxpayers because it is heavy and it takes up enough of our typical trash dumpster. So I thank you for all these programs. I ask that we consider not making it a pilot program. And if, and if it takes a little more work, can you go, go back to the drawing board and let's see if we can make this an entire city, not a pilot program. Let's help everybody work on this project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Laura Cella. Um, is there anyone else who's joined us who would like to speak? At the moment, doesn't seem to be. Um, and has anyone received an email? No? Okay, um, sounds good. Uh, so moving on to new business. First item is the approval of the minutes of the Public Works Committee of Tuesday, January 4th. May I have a motion, please? Ms. Shanahan moves the minutes. Um, are there any changes, additions, uh, Ms. Shanahan? I just have a couple of um, additions and I think probably the easiest thing to do is to say the page number and the paragraph and reread it just for the record. So if that's okay, I'll do that quickly. I have four changes that I was gonna make. Um, the first one is on page 16. It's the third full paragraph and I'll just read the paragraph as I think it should read. Ms. Shanahan I had a concern about some of the types of tree maintenance programs that include the use of herbicides, and she wants to know what types of herbicides are being used, comma, why they're being used, and whether there is notification of the use to homeowners, period. She said that Norwalk has watersheds that run into Long Island Sound and that the use of herbicide is a very big concern for the city. That's my first change. My second page is in the full paragraph um, on the same page, the seventh paragraph. Ms. Shanahan asked if homeowners can be notified if there is the use of herbicides in the vicinity of their homes. Then on page 17, um, it's the third paragraph down. Um, I think that Pathfinder is, should be capitalized because it's the name of the herbicide that's being used. Um, and Pathfinder shows up two places. It's at, um, in the second line down and in the fourth line down. So um, it should say Pathfinder 2. That should be capitalized as um, a product name. And then my last change is on page 21 in the sixth full paragraph. Um, Ms. Shanahan also agreed with Ms. Young. That's the way it is. She said that she would like to coordinate with Mr. Sotnik on inviting other conservation organizations to the tree advisory committee meeting to let them know that this presentation will be happening. And those are my changes. Thank you. Um, can you please email those to Anthony and copy Monique? Sure. Um, that would be great. Um, are there any other changes, additions? Uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Uh, on page 20, paragraph seven, um, it doesn't quite capture 
what I was trying to convey, uh, perhaps it could be Ms. Johnson said that um, she would like to remove herself as an example from this. Um, that I think it's a little bit more of what I was trying to say. And the rest seems to be in line with what I intended. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, um, all in favor of the minutes being approved, including those amendments, to signify by raising your hand. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, uh, minutes are uh, approved. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is Item number two, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to execute an agreement between the city of Norwalk and Tie and Bond, Inc. for the professional engineering services for the project 4177-DRG 2022-1, design and permitting for Lockwood Lane and Heather Lane storm drainage improvements on an hourly basis for some not to exceed $256,000, account noted. Um, this is... Um, finishing up a project. So I would like to turn this over to Mr. Carr. Uh, or, yes. Yeah. You, want a, you want a motion first? Uh, yes. Thank you for that motion. Mr. Livingston moves the item. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. So this, uh, this project has a little bit of history and I'll, I'll give the synopsis in hopefully two minutes or less. Uh, there was a drainage study completed in this area uh, in 2007 by time bond. And when we say the project area, uh, that's on or around uh, the Heather's Lane Street to about the, the uh, Newark River. Uh, so going down Lockwood West towards the Newark River. Um, in 2012, the city completed. So from that study uh, resulted in recommendations uh, to improve the drainage system there and reduce flooding. Um, as part of those recommendations, uh, there was a project that was recommended for construction. Half of that project was constructed in 2012. Uh, and that's the limits of that project was approximately from uh, 21 Lockwood Lane down to the Norwalk River. So the upstream half from 21 Lockwood Lane towards east, towards George and Heather's Lane uh, was not completed. So there's a bit of history. Well, with the flooding in the area, uh, it is a DPW uh, problem spot, trouble area, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so as following Tropical Storm Ellison, Ida, and, and having this in our database, there's been, there was numerous uh, inquiries uh, to the city of Norwalk, uh, to Department of Public Works, to rectify the situation and complete the project and, and again, further investigate the drainage. So uh, having said that, after Elsa and Ida, uh, my staff and I looked at a variety of projects citywide, this being one of them. Uh, I learned a little bit more about the history in the background that we actually did half the project. And the only reason why we didn't do the half was related to capital funding shortages. So this go around, um, Vanessa and her team issued a request for proposals uh, to finish basically, we'll call it the second leg or the second half of the uh, project. Uh, Ty and Bond was the successful uh, proposer. We received two proposals. Uh, one was double in price, uh, Ty and Bond being the, the, the lower of the two costs, which, was, which you see before you uh, for $256,000. And what that essentially gets us is the design work that's needed to prepare construction bid documents, i.e. project specifications and drawings uh, for contract bidding to complete that upstream half. Um, again, this is a known hotspot, a known trouble area, and we couldn't finish it the first time. So we will be using ARPA funding uh, for the design of the construction bid documents. Uh, we don't know at this point if we'll have ARPA funding available uh, for the construction. Again, that, that, that all depends on, on the administration and, and additional funding sources from ARPA. But for now, we know for sure that this will be uh, funded with ARPA funds. So that's, that was part of the original plan. Uh, Vanessa and her team did a great job. Again, there was two bidders. One was double the price. Uh, and Time Bond, again, for the record, did do the original drainage study uh, in 2007 for the entire area. So Vanessa, unless I missed anything, please feel free to, to provide additional context. I don't know if somebody has questions. I think that Anthony covered everything. That's all I have, Madam Chairman. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see you. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so we'll uh, we'll vote. Um, all in favor? Raise your hand, please. 
Um, if you're off camera, could you put your little hand up, Ms. Young, with us? There she is. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, um, okay. So all in favor? Opposed? Was that, was that an opposed, Ms. Shanahan? No, I didn't think. Okay. Um, abstentions? All right. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Item three. <clears throat> Authorize the mayor, Harry W. Willing, to execute a no-cost agreement between the city of Norwalk and Helpsy for curbside collection of textiles in the city of Norwalk. Uh, would someone like to move that, please? Ms. Shanahan moves the item. Um, I will turn that over to you, Mr. Carr, and perhaps you could just address the, the question of uh, it being a pilot program and how we'll, we'll sure. move on with that. We did, re we did see the... Um, the presentation from Helpsy at the last meeting. So uh, we have a lot of information already. Um, and I think that you know, we're, we're here for the vote. So uh, go ahead, Anthony. Okay, uh, just related Madam Chairman about the pilot program. So typically it's been prior practice of the city and also my prior um, positions held. The, the hardest thing for getting these, these new programs introduced and, and implemented is, is, the, is the wind up and, and the public outreach and the interest and the money and the capital and the operating expenses. Once the project is in, in my opinion, it's very hard to take it off the books. The hard lift is getting it on the books. So when we say pilot program, it's, it's just because the, the program is in its inception, right? So uh, it, it's no different that we're in year two now of the food scrap composting pilot program. At, at some point, yes, we will remove the word pilot, um, but we leave the word pilot in because it gives us the ability if let's just say for some reason there is a, a the city feels or helps he feels they want to separate or, or, or change directions for any any number of reasons, um, it, it gives us a little bit more flexibility with the vendor and it basically lets the public know, hey, this is new, this is something we're trying because because there is new technology. So there'll be an app where you schedule appointments and and it's going to be a little bit uh, different. Uh, Residents are not encouraged to call customer service, although I'm sure that will happen in the beginning, and that's fine. And after a while, customer service, and, and once everybody's kind of acclimated to the new system, uh, people will know, um, well, most of the people will know, to contact helps you directly with any pickup issues or, or, or collection issues. So we call it a pilot program just because it is, it, it is a pilot, uh, but we very much want to remove the word pilot at some point, and, and there's not a, that's not a finite point in time. And if you go to Google and you type in you know, pilot program, you know, I've seen any, any pilot programs last anywhere from one to three, four years. So it, it varies, again, based on, on the jurisdiction. But we, we certainly hope that this, be, this becomes a permanent program, much like the food scrap uh, composting program, which is going to hopefully be now on a successful third year. Uh, we did request additional operating budget um, funds in for the food scrap composting program. Um, again, we, we hope that it, it, it expands past the pilot program. But I would say it's, it's no less important. Or, or, or less permanent of a program if it has the word pilot in it. But at some point that will come out. Mr. Livingston? Yeah, just on that point, I, I've looked at the presentation. I didn't, didn't even actually see the word pilot. I mean, am I missing some page or something? No, you're not, you're not um, Councilman. It's, I think in, in passing, it, may, it might've been in emails, uh, might've been maybe when myself or staff verbally described at the last council meeting, although I, I didn't look at the minutes as meticulous as, mm -hmm. as some, I think that maybe myself or staff have referred to it as a pilot program, maybe in passing conversations or emails, but it's certainly not on the agreement between Helpsy and, and the city of Norwalk. And it, it won't be on the city of Norwalk's webpage either that it's a pilot program. We're not going to call it, you know, curbside recycling pilot program. I mean, we're likely not going to put that. It's just kind of an understood thing. And sometimes in, in passing that that term comes up. Yeah. Okay. That, that's helpful. What is the initial term projected to be proposed to be? I believe the initial contractual, the no cost contract, I believe is one year, but Jessica or Chris, I can't see on my phone if everybody's on. Uh, am I? Jessica's on. You're correct, Chief. You're yes, correct, okay. Chief. okay. One year. Okay. And, and with the option of terminating it if either party needs to or it, and or extending it year by year. Great. Great. I think it's terrific. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Ms. Shanahan. And assuming that it gets passed by council in the next week or two, um, when, how, when will it start? How soon can we start making use of it? I believe uh, once, so once council passes, 
about 10 to 14 days, uh, the law department generally um, prepares a contract for execution by both parties, the mayor and, and Helpsy. Uh, so councilman, I think that once they have an executed contract, Helpsy does. Um, I believe they said six to eight weeks roll out after that, Jessica, is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. So they were looking early spring to launch the program and, and you know, start advertising and, and reaching out to the public. Great. Can't wait. We'll yeah. definitely open our district because we, um, we'll reach out to neighborhood associations and whatnot to let them know. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. That'd be helpful. Depending on timing, if it works, and I don't want to delay it, but, but um, birthday is always a great time to do these things. Yes. Yeah. Sure is. Agreed. Fourth, right? Agreed. Yeah. We could right now. There's nothing precluding us from setting that as a goal. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? I, I I'm thrilled about this. The number of sweaters, blankets, things like that that I've had to throw away because my dog chewed a hole in them. You know, they're <laughs> perfectly good. You know, but it's, it's like I can't take. I can't donate them. I can't do anything with them. So uh, yeah, dogs, puppies, you know, uh, Jessica. So chairwoman, the transfer station has bins that you can bring items like that to. Yes. You know what? You're right about that. You are right about that. I have not taken advantage of that, but curbside easier, that's be easier for everybody. Yes. So, um, okay. Um, all in favor. Opposed abstentions. All right, the item carries unanimously. Excellent. All right, uh, next item on the agenda, item four, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to execute an amendment to the April 13, 2021 agreement between the city of Norwalk and the Grasso Companies LLC for project PM 2021-1 pavement management program. The amendment is to extend the agreement for a period of one year at a sum not to exceed $1,535,029.39 with an option of a potential amendment after the new fiscal year funds become available. Uh, do I have a motion? Mr. Keegan moves the item um, and I will turn this over to uh, Anthony or Vanessa, I believe will take this. Uh, this is an issue of a, a calendar year versus a fiscal year and it's a little bit complicated, but Vanessa can explain. Um, thank Vanessa. you. Please. Oh, thank you. Um, so what you have in front of you is really the first extension of the paving contract. Um, so we had the bid out last year and we have the option to extend a grasses contract for two periods of one year. So uh, we're about to finish that one year and now it's time for the extension. Um, what I wanna bring to your attention is that our paving program runs on a calendar year, the way that we bid. And unfortunately, our funds run on a fiscal year. So that was not a big issue before, because as you can remember, we come in front of you to approve a contract around this time of the year. And usually when the funds become available in um, June, Ju July, we come back and we do the amendment to that contract to add the extra streets that we're gonna finish paving. Um, so this is exactly the same thing, but I just wanna bring up to your attention that we do not have enough funds in the account to put all the streets that we are planning to pave under this one year extension. So you're gonna see us coming back again in June to ask to add the, 23 accounts and add the remaining of the funds to finish what we're planning to do this year. So this is only the tricky part on this one. So it is still part of the first year extension, but there will be an amendment to it because of the funds. And then next year, uh, if both parties agree, we're going to come back for a second extension. And again, we'll have an amendment. So that's what it is really the only tricky part. So now Getting to the contract itself, usually we spent last year was about $3.5 million on the contract. We have now 1.5 in the account and we're gonna come back depending on the rules that we still have left for a close to two, two something million dollars. Um, we have, uh, we did a very good job this year, the whole department 
Um, we brainstorm for many, many hours, the whole team to see how we can be extremely efficient this year and try to do the three operations at the same time, meaning the drainage, the sidewalks, and the paving. So after understanding where we need to go, what were the restrictions on each area, we came up with a list. So we are very confident with the list that we created. Um, again, as part of the memo, this is very superficial of the whole project that we're gonna be doing with paving. Um, unfortunately, the plant's only open in April. So this money has to bring us from April all the way to June. So that's where are the streets that you're seeing. And some of them may slide more to, towards July, but we wanna make sure that is already part of this contract that we're giving to them. Um, another thing that I wanna call to your attention, we didn't make a change order item that we usually we do for 10% because we are pretty much trying to put everything in the contract based on the funds that we have in the account. So when we come back for the amendment, you're gonna see not only um, the amendment with the change order in case we have something extra that we, we can do at the end of the year. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, questions? Okay, all set to vote. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Uh, next item on the agenda. Item five, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Willing, to execute any and all necessary documents for the National Fish and Wildlife F Foundation, Five Star and Urban, Urban Waters Re Restoration Grant related to the city of Norwalk participation as a partner in the grant. Who would like to move that? Ms. Shanahan, I knew you would. <laughs> and I know that you have a lot to contribute to uh, explaining this. Um, so Anthony, do you want to, uh, to run through anything? Um, um I could give the, a brief high level overview and then what I think uh, to turn over to Councilman Shanahan for the details, because she did her and, and Louise, Miss Washer uh, and the Newark uh, River Watershed Association and the Land Trust, they did put a lot of time into this and grants are never easy. I know that Vanessa and Paul and my staff are applying for several, one of them related to climate change and trees and pollinated pathways and, and then a third one. But uh, they take time and you don't always get them. And, and they're awful lot of work sometimes for the letdown and the disappointment. But the, the, the high level is that this grant was a, a US, U.S. Fish and Wildlife grant. OK, and the grantee or the, the, the person, the entity given the grant uh, was a entity known as Highstead, also abbreviated as H2H. Um, and that H2H is also part of, I believe, the Hudson to Housatonic um, corridor. So that's where they get the H2H from. But U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the top tier. The grantee, the entity given the grant that will manage the grant will be the grant administrator uh, is Highstead. And then all the other um, participants are what they call lower tier participants or sub tier participants. Uh, and those include the um, Norwalk Land Trust, um, the uh, Tree Advisory Committee, the city of Norwalk, the city departments uh, like recreation and parks, engineering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and forgive me, I know there's other departments in there too, Norwalk Tree, tree uh, the Tree Alliance, um, and Lisa, before I turn over to you, I'm sure you'll, you'll fill in the gaps. But basically, this, this uh, grant to $50,000, uh, it is a one-to-one -one match. So if we ask, we receive $50,000, we have to uh, match $50,000 in in-kind services. Well, they did better than that. And I believe we're matching somewhere in the $75,000 range, actually maybe $74,000. So we actually gave more of a one-to-one. -one. We gave more than we, than we, than we took. But um, I have to say that the staff put a lot of work into it. Lisa, I know you put personally put a lot of work into it. Um, I know Luis did also too, so I don't want to discredit her efforts. Um, I know it was a group effort, but you really led the charge. And again, uh, it's $50,000. Um, and of that money too, um, it, it's listed here. And in the backup, you'll see that $10,000 is earmarked um, for 10 trees, uh, each at about $1,000 each. That will be paid for on the Olmstead Street contract to be planted at Woodward Park. Again, we're working with Councilman Shanahan, Luis Washington, and a lot of other members of the TAC and the Tree Alliance to situate the, and plant those trees. So my staff, I commend you for working with them and Councilman, I commend you and, and Ms. Washer too for taking the lead. But I know there's a lot more details and I don't wanna steal the thunder, so please. <laughs> actually, there's really no thunder to steal. The thunder really um, actually goes to you, um, 
Mr. Carr and Paul and Chris Tory because this was my first introduction to Norwalk's uh, Public Works Department. And um, you guys all were, you gave me the impression that what Norwalk wants to do is say yes first, because we had a big ask, just as Anthony said, we needed to have matching um, funds. And the city was like, let's find a way to yes, let's try to support you on this. And so I thank the um, Department of Public Works for you guys showing up for us and agreeing to dig holes for all of these trees and help us with the planning and whatnot. And I'm looking forward to doing, I think we have a couple more grants in the works. So excited about all of that, but that's what our public works department's about. I mean, they try to get to yes first. So I really appreciate that Mr. Carr and Paul and Chris isn't here to hear me say that, but um, you guys did the heavy lift. You're going to do the heavy lifting. You're digging the holes for us. So thank you. And then um, yes, Louise Washer, she's kind of a force of nature in the city of Norwalk and she's um, got her fingerprints on so much good work that's um, going on. So we're delighted that um, we were able to get this. We're um, just starting the work right now. We were in the telephone today with the Norwalk Tree Alliance, Norwalk uh, Land Trust comes on board um, later in the week. And I think this is an exciting thing. And um, Darlene was also helpful because this a lot of this work is down in um, the Woodward Park area. And the idea is to try to connect Woodward Park and Oyster Shell Park and bring trees and greenery in a part of Norwalk that really needs it. So. Um, thank you very much for meeting Louise and me down in Woodward Park at least twice, I'm pretty sure, talking about this as well. So I hope you guys say yes, that you'll take the 50,000. <laughs> um, um, Ms. Shanahan, thank you so much for, uh, for your work on this and, um, and, and bringing this to the Public Works Department. It's terrific. Um, Mr. Livingston, you have a question. No, it wasn't a question. Um, I was, I was um, also going to thank Ms. Shanahan. This is a lot. I know how much work she put into this because you were doing this before you got in the council. I know how much time it took. So thank you for doing this. And thank Ms. Washer. Everybody, anybody who doesn't know Ms. Washer should know her. She, she has, as Lisa said, is a force of nature. and She's wonderful, involved in so many things. So thank you both so much. Thank you, Chief Carr, for you and your staff, Paul, and everybody for for, do, for being so accommodating, for putting so much work in it yourself. As you said yourself, all this time that's gone into it. It's really great, um, and uh, but thank you all. Thank you for bringing it to the city and doing it. Uh, Ms. Young. I, I just have to say thank you to, to everybody, of course, um, and, and you know, to Lisa, uh, Lisa and Ms. Washer, we, we clearly know where your passion lies, and it's so good to, you know, have an opportunity to see things happen. Um, it takes some time but and, and, and some dedication, but we're moving forward, and, and so I just appreciate your efforts and everybody, so thank you. And my two little visits were just that, two little visits, but I appreciate the opportunity. Um. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'd just like to point out, you know, the, that the city is benefiting in so many areas from this. I mean, we're focused in public works on the 10 trees, um, but, you know, it's, um, you know, there's going to be, um, you know, restoration work done, um, one of the things that um, the Tree Alliance is doing is a tree school and outdoor class, classroom management. Um, there was also, you know, a reduction in stormwater. I mean, there's just so many benefits uh, to Norwalk through this, um, through these grants. So um, really, really appreciative. Um, all right, any other questions, comments? All righty, all in favor? Opposed? Extensions, motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everybody. I so Thank appreciate you. it. <laughs> Thank you. Well done, Ms. Shanahan <laughs> and Ms. Young and everybody, everyone who was involved. Um, Paul and Anthony and Chris, wherever he is. Well done. Thank you. Um, okay. Item six, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to execute an agreement to the execute an amendment to the agreement between the city of Norwalk and tie and bond Inc for construction inspection observation services to extend the agreement for the first two optional additional terms of one year billable on an hourly basis for an amount not to exceed $200,000 accounts noted. Uh, do I have a motion please? Mr. Livingston moves the item. Um, and this is, uh, I'll turn this over to um, Anthony. Yes, Madam Chair, I'll say something briefly uh, before I pass over to Vanessa. So we've been working with uh, Time Bond uh, for quite a bit uh, on construction observation services. Uh, they've done extremely well. They're very competent, very sound, they're very fair with the pricing. Uh, we've had no quality control issues with them. Uh, they're extremely responsive to when we need them to go from project to project. And as you know, 
uh, our capital project list is growing. And then obviously there's a lot of things that come up in between. So uh, as this item says, it, it, is, it is an amendment for the first of one or two years. We get a two year, up to two year extension. So we're, we're requesting to uh, your authorization or the mayor's authorization, but your approval uh, to, to execute the first of uh, the first of one, uh, first of two extensions, excuse me. Um, they will be overseeing a variety of projects. As you know, we have some bigger projects coming on board now, uh, the Jimmy Hollow Bettsbrook drainage project uh, and so a lot of other projects that I'll, I will uh, respectfully defer to Vanessa to, to provide additional information on those projects and uh, um, tie and bond services. Uh, that's correct. It's really for a uh, really inspection service on the major projects that we have uh, going on through the year. Uh, usually we have one person with the paving crew all times, and also we move them around as needed to cover sidewalk or drainage. And this year we're um, probably going to also we'll need the person's help to cover some of the drainage project at Dreamy Hollow. Um, um, again, last year we have more money in that in their contract. This extension we realized we didn't use as much, so we're gonna we're coming with a smaller amount, but we believe that will be enough to cover us for the year. Mr. Livingston. Yeah, I, I guess the question I have is, and I probably asked this last year, but I forget. Um, is this? A, I mean, how to phrase this? I mean, is this because we always have a tough time hiring engineers, or is this just a more efficient way of doing this, or both? Um, well, I have a, now. I have a full staff, right? Unless if we open new positions, um, we're still going to need. So we, we use a lot of people to be able to cover the ground during uh, construction season. So usually we use some interns. We usually hire uh, interns during the summer. And also we need people that be there all times while construction is happening. So this way we don't have many headaches and we're making sure that everything is being built as per our spec and standards. So these are really two extra hands that is needed. Um, can I have as a full-time people? Yes, but um, unfortunately we do not have those positions. So that's why we go out and it may be even kind of cheaper because we have them as needed, right? So this usually covers two, inspection, two inspectors. It will be one most of the year and the second one usually on the month that we are the busiest. Gotcha, thank you. Just to follow up on that, that is a bit of a change. Um, what you're saying, Vanessa, compared to a few years ago, where, um, so, so just to confirm that you think we're actually saving money now by doing it this way, as opposed to having someone on staff. Well, the truth is that now the engineering market is extremely high. Um, so, the, you know, it, it changes all the time, right? So two, three years ago, or maybe a little bit more, this was more expensive because probably we could hire people on a lower rate. Now, the truth is what the public sector is paying is not anymore as attractive. And you, we are seeing this all the time that uh, the big companies are still engineers from the other companies and the salaries are much, much higher. That I really believe that now with all the chain supply issues with the construction, being so high, we're not going to be able to really fill a position with that type of, because the person that comes to us is already very experienced, is not a out of college or a person that just got trained to become an inspector. Um, this person in particular, they ha he has been working for us for a few seasons now, and he has all the credentials and he is extremely um, experienced. So to hire a person at this level, it will probably cost nowadays more. I see. Okay. Um, big change from a few years ago. Uh, that's but it I may think. change by right. You know, I may, I may, I may <laughs> give exactly an opposite <laughs> speech two years from now, you know, depending Understood. on how the economy will go. Yes. But, okay. Well, Madam Chair, well, the other thing too is about having an, an independent inspector. It, it, it helps the city uh, and it protects us and actually in some instances serves as a, as a third party opinion, right? So it's a little bit of a buffer where if, if let's just say there's a disagreement between us and the contractor or the public and, 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 and my department, at least it's a third party that, that you know, is independently licensed, right? And they have their individual credentials 
yes, they're retained by the city. So, but they're also not going to uh, stamp or sign off. And a lot of consultants, rightfully so, having been one of my prior life, will not take that risk and, and stamp off and sign off on a, on a wall that looks a little shaky or a pavement thickness that might be kind of dicey. You know, no one's going to want that liability, but especially in the private sector. And that's why they have professional liability insurance and, and coverage because they, it's not worth it to them to, 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 to have someone lie and them swear to it. That's not how they operate, at least not a good consultant, not the ones that we work with. So it, it provides an outside perspective, a third party expertise. And again, it, it helps buffer us and, and, and it gives us time, you know, to think about things as they're moving dynamically. Uh, it gives us uh, you know, the ability to oversee more projects. And Vanessa's right. The, the senior engineers and even her, herself, even myself, would have to go out and inspect all these projects. I mean, especially in the summertime when things are going real strong and there's paving and drainage and sidewalk, concrete curb. I mean, everybody spread thin that all they would be doing, the senior staff, is inspecting and doing inspection reports and loading up photos. It would just be unmanageable. So, and Vanessa's right. To get somebody experienced, you know, 10, 15, 20 years with, with nice, a nice construction engineering inspector, I mean, you're looking at six figures. You probably have to pay them between 125 and 175, depending on their experience and, and, and whatever. Um, and then benefits too. So I mean, you're looking at a, you know, a two hundred thousand dollar investment probably for one 10 to 20 year, really robust, experienced license, licensed contract, uh, licensed engineer who's a construction inspector. Okay, really important points. Um, thanks for that uh, explanation. All right. Any other questions or comments on this item? All right, that being said, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? All right, that carries unanimously. Okay, uh, all right, so now we move on to uh, information and discussion. And the first item there is uh, item B, tree operations report and programming and the 2022 Tree City USA cert recertification and growth award application information, which I yes. will give to Mr. Carr. So Madam Chairman, we are a uh, tree city. Uh, this would be the 18th year if we recertified, which we will be. Um, and there's two components of, of, of this item. And I, I will defer to Vanessa or, or Paul, because I know Paul has put a lot of work into this too. And you know, Vanessa and I have the fortune and ability where we get to review and quality control a lot of the work. And of course we get our, we roll up our sleeves and we get in the trenches as, as needed. But but a lot of the employees that, that we that we work with on a daily basis, they take a lot of pride in, in these applications. So to some to say, you know, it's nice to be tree city, big deal. You know, it is a big deal. And especially with the with the effort that we're making to preserve the tree canopy and expand our can tree canopy. And, and I think right now with the movement and the initiative going with the sustainability aspect, you know, even that aside, the, these these applications, the, the it's not a one page, two page form. Uh, the there's, a, there's a lot of questions that you have to answer. There's a lot of backup that you have to provide about how many hours of staff time for certain, for task A, B, and C. And again, I'll defer to Paul on that. Uh, but the recertification is not necessarily just a carte blanche, um, two-page application that the mayor signs and we're done with it. And then the growth award, that's to, that's to show that you have an existing tree program that is growing, uh, you know, hence the term growth. But there's a certain amount of points that you need to, to show growth. And I believe the number is 10 and we scored 13. So, and again, that's shown in different areas of, uh, you know, enhancing existing ordinances, uh, introducing new new ordinances, um, expanding your program. Did you plant more trees in the last? Did, did you cover more geography? And again, I'll defer to Paul in those details. But you know, I looked at the application myself because Vanessa and I had a review, and I said, "Jesus, this is this is pretty robust for 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 the, the recertification and the growth award." But you know, you know, it took took a lot of review, a lot a lot longer than I thought it was going to take. Let's put it that way. Um, but nonetheless, we gave it the attention it deserves, and and we know that Paul's very diligent and and right down to, to, the, to the penny. He, he quantified exactly what we invested into our program, which is very important for these applications. So um, Vanessa, if you wanna say something uh, to give context, that's great. If not, Paul, uh, please. Yeah, I, I, we just wanna bring really, one of the reasons why this is here is that we wanna to bring to your attention that that's another thing that our department is doing. Um, we haven't got yet, we just filled the application and Paul can explain a little more about it, but. Again, um, as Mr. Carr said, was hours of his work to be able to fill all those applications. And he really puts a lot of effort and he has everything there. So I think that it, it is, I think it's important that we all understand that this is also happening besides everything else that, that the, the public works is doing. We are also the ones that apply for those. 
Um, so I'll let just Paul explain the difference between the two of them. Paul, if you want to just go about what is the three city recertification and the growth award. So for people that is new to this committee, they can just understand the difference between the two of them and the applications went in. I will probably wait a, a couple of months until we know if we got it. And of course, we're going to let you guys know. Thank you. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, basically, with the Tree City USA recertification, we do that each year. And there is one thing I will mention. Uh, the memo says 21. That is correct. It's the end of fiscal year 21. So that's why it says that in the item I had given Monique, I put 22. So it's supposed to be 21. Uh, in there, you can see the variety of information that you've got to put in. And it's a full digital application. So everything has to be uploaded to a website for the Arbor Day Foundation. And we, you can see we have to put together the budgets of what we propose to spend on the budget and then what we actually end up spending. And that's the numbers that end up getting put in. They wanna know the uh, uh, population of Norwalk because in essence, what they end up doing and as you go through the numbers, what we have to have is we have to spend $2 per capita. We have to have a tree ordinance, which we have. And we have to have an Arbor Day celebration. We have to have an affiliation with a 501c3 tree organization, which you saw from the previous item. The Norwalk Tree Alliance is that body, and they work with grants and a variety of other things. So when we put all the numbers together of all of the different categories, and they give you specific categories, we all totaled between the city, Parks and Rec, all of the different city organizations, and then the 501c3 organization all together with the uh, time, volunteer time, it came out to $803,000, uh, uh, 455. And basically it came out to $9.10 per capita. We needed to have two. So we're spending quite a bit. It's a little down from other years because the uh, disposals of some of the trees, the sites were closed during COVID. So we didn't spend quite as much on that, but all everything spent on trees basically counts toward the number. And then they want to know what you did for the community management of trees too. Uh, how many trees were planted between those organizations? It ended up being 171 total trees planted in that time period. Uh, trees pruned, they want to know was 290. And then the number of trees removed by the, the city was 110. And then we go in and we get into now the growth award. And the growth award is basically expanding your programs as Chief Carr said, and there are a pile of different categories, 87 different categories that fall under five, six, uh, five different uh, areas of building your team, measuring the trees and forest, planning the work, performing, and community framework. And there's a list of all of the different areas that I picked this year that we fit with what we had done from planning. And I described what the city did. We established a new tree list when we put out the new tree contract. We had uh, planting trees. We've gone through the various departments and we've continued to plant trees as we've done other years. You were able to get points for that. Uh, performing and uh, protecting trees, the enforcement proceedings. Chris Torrey had one up on Bel Air that we were able to recover $1,875 in fees and penalties for them doing an illegal tree cutting. Uh, community framework. Uh, the city held uh, one or more meetings of various departments, common council members, uh, tree advisory committee, nonprofit, and uh, uh, council person Shanahan and Chief Carr had put together the tree summit planning uh, meeting that uh, Councilman Livingston also attended. So that was something we were able to get some credit for. And then the awareness, the Arbor Day events, we ended up because of COVID, we did the event out at Oak Hills, but we also still involved the two schools and the Tree Alliance had done an Arbor Day project for planting also too. So we were able to get points there. I never usually go with just 10 in case they don't like something. I don't like to cut it that close. So that's why I always pick an extra category and went with something that gave us 13 points. Uh, we should find out that we've gotten the recertification for both around Arbor Day. That's usually when we find out each year. And just to give you an idea of where we were this year with the growth award points, what took place after July 1st, which wasn't eligible in this, cap, uh, in this package, but what we did after July 1st with the passing of the new ordinance and the revisions and that, and some of the other things, I probably have close to 20 points already for next year. 
So we'll be in good shape on that just from what we've already done. So that's basically it in how everything goes together. And like uh, Chief Carr said, there's a lot of information that goes into it to pull all the numbers together and recertify everything. And, and it's all digital. So you have to upload all the photos, press clippings, the actual uh, mayor's proclamation, all of that stuff has to be uploaded in order to get your recertification. Always going above and beyond, Paul. Well done. 20 points already for next year. Um, uh, Mr. Livingston. Yeah, just uh, I want to thank uh, Paul and the team for doing all this. You said there's a lot of information involved, but it's actually a lot of work, uh, as, as you pointed out, a lot of work behind it. And I really do appreciate all the efforts you guys have put into it. And it's uh, it really shows in the in sort of the, the focus now. And uh, as you said, 20 points next year. Next, the following year will be 30, right, Paul? And we keep going. Yeah, we don't like to give them too many. That way there, it doesn't set the bar too high that we have to exceed the following year. Anyway, well, thank you guys for all your efforts. It's really great. Ms. Shanahan. Well, once again, I have to thank um, Paul, especially because of all of the um, times I call him up about trees and Anthony for allowing me to call Paul and talk about trees and Chris about trees. You guys have really gone above and beyond, and this was a big, heavy lift this year between um, the tree summit that Anthony and I um, pulled together in May. That was a lot of work, Anthony, <laughs> we, but I enjoyed every minute of it, and thank you for um, being such a good partner on that. And um, Paul, I know how much work goes into it, and it's just so obvious with all of the numbers. So, so appreciate that, um, once again, the Public Works Department is supporting this really, really important initiative for Norwalk to bring more trees to a city that desperately needs them. And I know that it's important to you and I really appreciate all the support when um, we do call about keeping trees in the ground and putting more of them there too. Thank you. Um, yeah, just like to add, you know, uh, since there was the talk about our tree canopy a year or two ago, um, you know, there re you've all made such a great concerted effort to uh, improve upon that. And I think that the last summer with the storms that we had, um, even people who are not known to be environmentalists and tree huggers um, are, have really become aware that you know climate change is here. Uh, we're dealing with it, and trees are part of the solution. So um, it's something that everyone can get behind. So uh, great work, thank you, Paul and Anthony. You're welcome, everyone, everyone in GPW. Thank you. Um, anyone else on this before we move on? Um, all right, next is item C, the monthly solid waste report for December, 2021. All right, Madam Chairwoman, I will, um, I know we, we pre-briefed and I gave you kind of the numbers and everybody could look on the reports and, and see a lot of negatives, right? So a lot of less garbage is going out uh, compared from the same time last year. Uh, when I say garbage, that's the municipal solid waste. Um, the recycling numbers are also down too, which means our revenue is down. So if you go to the bottom chart, uh, where it basically gives you the sum of the recycling revenue, MSW and recycling revenues, you'll see that the first line is almost 30% um, from our transfer station tip fees. Again, that's the garbage that, that, that's going out. Um, and then there's obviously the recycling revenues as well, which we're the only state in, excuse me, we're the only city uh, in the state of Connecticut that does receive a, um, a revenue for um, recycling on a per tonnage basis. So uh, under our existing agreement with city carding, which expires June 30th, 2023, uh, for the operation of our Crescent Street transfer station, uh, for the collection and disposal of the recy of recycling, uh, and also for the collection and disposal of, of um, city garbage in the Fort Taxing District. We, um, all three of those contracts expire June 30th, 2023. But underneath the recycling contract, we're still paid a revenue of $17.50. Uh, just to prepare everybody, I know we say it almost every meeting, but uh, likely uh, once we get a new, a new vendor in there uh, and we open this up to RFP, um, that, that will be a swing of, and Jessica, when I turn this over to you momentarily, you can go a little bit more in the numbers, but, uh, we're seeing payments of anywhere from 65 to $85 a ton, you know, but we're getting $17 now, right? So it's actually closer to 85 to over a hundred dollars a ton that we'll have to absorb, right? So we're getting a credit basically for recycling now, and that's going to be an expense in fiscal year of 2024 that we'll have to budget for starting our, our not this budget cycle, but the next, next operating budget cycle. Um, so again, just want to prepare everybody for that. Um, you know, depending on the vendor that could, that could depend on the price, but just so could you do me a favor since, since you're here, I want to take advantage of this. 
can you just go through a little bit of, of what the high level numbers mean and, and the changes? I mean, everyone sees negatives, but just kind of give a little bit of an overview what the curbside tonnage out is and, and the transfer station tip fee in the bottom, just to kind of the highlights just for the new committee members or, or those that don't study this report in as much detail as we have to. If you could just give them some context, Absolutely. What, what, what each Absolutely. line means. And Absolutely. So this report compares um, the month of December of 2021 to the month of December of 2020. And I, I added a footnote at the bottom that everyone can see, which was that the December 2021 was the, the or December 2020 was the height of the pandemic. And we, we really were seeing huge increases in numbers, both in garbage and recycling. So the fact that we are 10, 15% lower now last month is really a testament to how high we were in December of 2020. Um, the curbside tonnage, Actually, like I'm sorry, can, I interrupt, by, can I interrupt for one second? Sorry. Does that yeah. mean that we're more back to quote unquote normal? Um, so we're closer to a normal. What we're seeing is still a little bit higher than what we were pre-pandemic normals. Um, because people are still working from home. Um, there's, you know, a, a work-life balance that's more at home. Um, so our numbers are slightly higher. Okay. So people are pretty much cleaning out their closets, but they're still working at home. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So we're, we're leveling out probably the, to the new normal. Um, Chief Carr, you'd like me to go line by line of this report? Well, I was thinking... You know, just to give a brief overview of, you know, what does curbside tonnage mean, the MSW tonnage out, because people might, might say, and I know I've asked you, but what do you mean by MSW tonnage out? What, is, what does that include and, and what does it not include? And, uh, you know, obviously curbside tonnage is pretty, pretty self-explanatory so, for the recycling and the MSW. But, but when you say transfer station tonnage for the recycling collection, just to give people an overview of what, what that is and isn't. Sure. So the, the curbside under MSW, which is uh, city garbage, Curbside tonnage is the tonnage collected in the fourth taxing district by city carting. So under that contract that Anthony was talking about that's expiring next year, that, that's that tonnage that's collected in the fourth taxing district. The MSW tonnage out are the tractor trailers that you see leaving the transfer station that have been loaded with the, the MSW off the tipping floor and that are br brought up to the um, burn plant. Uh, the transfer state transfer station operating fee is the cost uh, of the monthly operation fee that city carting charges us to operate the facility as well as haul the MSW out. Um, the transportation and disposal fee is that cost of $95 a ton that we're paying for the MSW to be hauled and then incinerated. Uh, and our curbside collection fee is the fee for the fourth sixth taxing district collection of garbage that Anthony was talking about for the city carting contract that expires uh, next year. The recycling collection uh, numbers, the curbside tonnage is the city carting uh, collection curbside. So not only do residents have toters, we also have the availability for buildings or small uh, condo associations to have dumpsters. So it's all of that curbside collection that, that city carting does citywide. The transfer station tonnage is the compactors that you have on site at the transfer station for both cardboard and single stream, as well as the hard plastic container. Um, and yeah, the cardboard, the single stream and the hard plastic. So we're paid the 1750 for all of that tonnage that comes into the transfer station. Um, and then the curbside collection fee for the recycling is what we pay city carting on a monthly basis to, to collect that recycling citywide. Uh, our transfer station tip fees, this is what we, the city, receive for garbage uh, that's dumped at the Norwalk transfer station. This is not, this is no other fees that we would accept for items that are accepted at the Nan Norwalk transfer station. So this number doesn't include the cost to dispose of air conditioners, tires, certain batteries, things like that. This is only garbage disposal. The recycling revenue curbside is based on the tonnage from that city carting collects curbside um, with their trucks. 
And then the recycling revenue from the transfer station are those three items, the single stream, the cardboard, and the hard plastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone have any questions for Jessica? Thanks for that rundown, Jessica. You got um, it. Ms. Johnson. Thank you so much. And I, I don't know if this is who best to ask, but what do you think might be a long-term approach to this diminished uh, revenue from the recycling? Like, is that something we're concerned about quite yet? Is that a pattern we see emerging we have to address or? So I, I think the diminished recycling for the month of December, 2021 is just I, I, us getting back to what was normal about that same time. Um, so I, I don't, I don't see a, a problem with these numbers sort of leveling back out to where they were. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Cause I just, you know, you see the negatives and then you think that there has been some talk in the press about recycling and in a way that may have a negative effect potentially, I'm not sure. So, yeah. Yeah, and like Chief Carr was saying, you're going to see a swing when we put the RFP out for recycling uh, after June 2023. And what we're seeing is a lot of the contracts, there's sort of a sliding scale of are they paying for one type of recycling, but you're, you're, you're not paying for another or it, it, there's a lot of different contracts that are out there. You're paying a flat fee for the collection or the, the cost to dispose of them, but then there's some sort of revenue that's being generated by the commodities market as well. Thank you very much for that, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right, Madam Chairman. Yeah, sorry. We're good from okay. Steph. Um, okay, so then uh, finally we have the food scrap drop-off report. Yes, so um, this report actually does say pilot at the top of it, if you look. Um, again, this is the second year of our food scrap drop off. We have two locations, uh, the Crescent Street Transfer Station and also the Rewaiting Community Center. Uh, when we finished the, the, the initial pilot year, the first fiscal year last year, uh, the, the amount of volume was split roughly 65% going to Rewaiting Community Center and 35% going to the transfer station. Uh, and I believe the tonnage was approximately uh, 50, 55 tons um, of food scrap removed from the municipal waste stream, which would have been, as Jessica mentioned earlier, MSW or, or city garbage. Um, the uh, This year, we're only about halfway through this fiscal year, but the numbers are trending pretty similarly. Uh, we have about 70% of the food scrap waste going to the Royal Avenue, excuse me, Royal Avenue Community Center, and also 30% going to the transfer station as of um, today, basically, to present day. Um, that's about 40 tons already. So all in all, we're, we're approaching that 100 ton mark, uh, which is about 200,000 pounds uh, of, of food scraps. So almost a quarter million of, of, of tonnage, if you want to look at it on, on a pound basis, uh, almost a quarter million pounds. So I think that's, that's pretty impressive for the first, well, I guess Jessica, uh, Lisa, Tom, first year and a half. I mean, so it's, it's, it's definitely not a dying program. Uh, I, I'd like to think that it's thriving. And I think it'll even do more so when we introduce that third location, uh, which will be at Cranberry Park, 99% sure, because uh, the, the, the facility has to be a manned facility or a staff facility, I should say. Um, we did apply for two grants, two different compost organizations. We got denied, uh, I believe in October, uh, for $15,000 each, but we did include it in this year's fiscal year 23 operating budget request, knowing that we would likely get denied. So that, that, that request so far I heard was, was uh, not taken out or, or not reduced. Uh, so assuming the operating goes through the process and gets approved, uh, we will be able to, to um, expand and introduce their location after July 1st of 2022, which will be Cranberry Park, barring any unforeseen uh, changes to the plan. I think you're right, Anthony, that it will um, increase once that is open, because I think a lot of people are like me, um, you know, just like with the textiles, right? I, I like... You know, if I ha have a couple things that, you know, maybe two sweaters or something, it doesn't dawn on me, oh, I could go down to the transfer station and drop it off. But if I could drop it, if I can drop food scraps at, 
Cranberry Park, which I go to on a regular basis, um, you know, and I think a lot of people um, think like that. So um, I, think it will, I think that it will increase um, as well. Um, Shanahan. Anthony, I have a question because it looks like, are these, um, is the numbers for 2021, 2022, it says, it looks like it's 40 tons. Is that through December 31st or January 31st, or do we know? Uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Jessica, that is up until December 31st, correct? Correct. Wow, so it looks like we're actually collecting even more than we did last year, year to year. So um, I'm just hoping that we keep this in the budget because I worry that it's gonna become more and more expensive, but. I guess like, should, is there ever a place where you start to feel like the tipping fees we're paying for regular garbage is kind of being offset to some degree? Do we feel like there's an impact at all? Can we say, is that part of the narrative? It, from a sustainability aspect, yes. There's, there's a lot of uh, pluses, but fiscally, Jessica, I, I correct me again if the numbers are wrong, but we're paying $95 a ton to get rid of our garbage, right, our MSW. So we've, we've said and we've proven that we've taken about 95 tons of MSW out, right? So, so we're not paying $95 a ton on that, which is which is fantastic. Instead, we're paying, I think the numbers work out from anywhere from 110 to $150 a ton, right, Jessica? So we're right. paying more to get rid of the food scraps. And Jessica, what are the numbers that you're seeing? I know industry standard is 125 to 150 a ton. So we're generally we're paying we're paying a sliding scale because it's based on the number of toters that we have. Um, and the weight of the toters. So the, it's a flat fee of $65 for the pickup. And then it's um, $5 a toter for the small toters and $10 a toter for the large toters. Um, Rowayton had switched over to the large toters or the 65 gallon toters a few months ago. Um, the Norwalk transfer station right after the pumpkins switched over to the large toters there as well. So you'll see the monthly cost per toter now is $10 at each location. So that that is sort of how the sliding scale of the cost per ton is based on the number of toters that it's picked up at each time that it's picked up. Right, and you don't get a discount for more. It'd be nice if we got a lower price for more toters, but you're really just paying more for more toters. But the number works out. I mean, I believe the vendor and us had discussions and, and, and anybody can Google this, but we, we backed into the numbers and ran our own analysis, but isn't the price point about, I mean, I've seen 110, but that's on the real low it's, side. Oh, it's anywhere from, 120. right, Go correct. Ahead. It's anywhere from like 115, 120, all the way up to 150 based on the number of toters that they're picking up each time they pick up. But they're looking as, as, as this, uh, these initiatives are, are become a little bit more streamlined. Um, I know Scarsdale uh, and a lot of other places in Westchester really picked on to this and, and, and really their programs are through the roof now. And I remember when Scarsdale just started theirs, um, but the, uh, as, as these programs expand and there's more demand, then there's more competition. And even our vendors said, look, the, these prices, if things keep trending the way they are, will likely start going down. So maybe there will be a day as the tipping fees go up, right? Because they're not going to keep going down the garbage tipping fees. They are they are going to go up. You know, at some point, will the two curves converge and and, and cross, and, and you'll get that kind of break even? It's likely. And but there's also a lot of environmental and sustainable benefits. So right now, you you're not sending it to, to an energy recovery plant. It, it's being used as compost. So I mean, there's can you really put a value on that? Probably not because it's invaluable. It's, it's a something that's hard to quantify, but. But for us, for our purposes, since we can quantify a dollar for our operating budget, the, 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 yes, the cost is the <laughs> cost is a little bit more now, but I wouldn't say significantly more to not expand the program. And that's when we'll keep hitting the pavement, no pun intended, and getting grants and, and, and we'll manage it in the operating budget and we'll just keep applying for grants to try to subsidize the program and expand it. Thank you. And that, and that increase in tonnage that you saw, uh, Councilwoman Shanahan, is also because of the November collection of of pumpkins. So we didn't account for that in last last fiscal year. So that it that jump in tonnage is the is those pumpkins. Right. Right, of course. Um so Miss Young has a question. <laughs> that that I think um all members of the committee, um, all members of the council can relate to. Do you want to ask that question, Miss Young? <laughs> <laughs> 
Sure. So thank you. I wasn't quite sure if this was the time or the place to ask it, but um, thank you, um, Chairwoman. So I, you know, when you're talking about recycling, um, so I have a box full of campaign signs. And so over the weekend, I was trying to find the best way to do it. Was I supposed to throw them in the garbage or not? And of course, the suggestion um, that I found was to not dispose of them that way if you could avoid them to kind of upcycle or recycle them. Um, and they gave examples of maybe like artists um, using them to, to create something or actually spray painting them and reusing them or donating them to someplace. But I wanted to know how, is that something, I mean, we don't want to dispose of plastics, right? In that way, because they're pretty hard material, right? I mean, so I don't know what to do. I say run Which again, Darlene. <laughs> I know I, have, I still have a whole lot left. left. <laughs> That's the best way That's to recycle the best them. Recycling. <laughs> Keep running. <laughs> I don't know. That, that, nah. Run away, maybe, but I don't know about the signs. <laughs> well, hopefully, you won't make that decision for another year and a half. Right. Uh, so I was really actually curious that. about that. No, I, I didn't know what to do with them. And, and um, it's a valid question. We see them all over town. Well, it's not right. just us. It's you know. It, how do you it's recommend most, that we? Well, they, they have the metal on them, uh, so they have you the metal. Right. Take the metal out. Right. Okay. So the metal, out. The, the metal out. stanchions can either be reused or recycled. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. metal is a, a a very good commodity for recycling. Yes. Unf unfortunately, that the sign themselves is paper that's probably laminated in plastic. And now I'm, I'm guessing, is that, that's what it is? Yes. Um, that's probably the hardest thing to recycle. Um, so I, I would say the suggestion to upcycle them or, or reuse them it is great. And maybe it's donating them to a school to see if they can use them in um, announcements for school events or a, a community center that could reuse them and cover them when they have events at their facilities. Um, th that would be my suggestion for you. I can dig into whether or not they can be actually recycled, um, but off the top of my head, I, I, I don't think they can be. That was Jessica's very nice way of saying they might become MSW. <laughs> I was trying not to say it that way. <laughs> Unfortunately, just because, no, but just because right, the wood, right. uh, excuse me, just because the plastic lamination, that's the only reason why. Otherwise, Correct. That they'd, be, they'd be recyclable if they didn't have those that, that plastic lamination that you do need to keep them upright and to keep them protected from the elements. So. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, Jessica. You're welcome. So since we're on recycle, I have a question related to it, but it's not an item of the agenda. Monique and I would like to know if you guys would like to receive the agenda from now on only electronically. So no paper copies anymore. Is everyone okay with that? I know that other committees uh, are only receiving them electronically. We are happy to still print and mail them to you. Um, but uh, so that's why I would like to ask you guys. I have to say for me personally, I have a vision problem um, that with one of my eyes and it's it's hard for me to really read and take everything in on a um, on the computer. Um, so I, I personally, I mean, I, it's terrible, but I am very good at recycling. I'm very no, no, it's okay. Uh, so I, we can definitely um, send it to you, Barbara. We have no problem with that, but I don't know if, the, because some people, don't want to receive all that uh, package uh, on a monthly basis. So um, is it okay if we just send to uh, Mrs. Smith and then everybody else will receive electronically? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's good. If I could do it, I would, but- um, Okay, no, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So starting next month, we'll, we'll try that. Perfect. If you guys really miss the paper uh, version, we are happy to reestablish the following month. Thank you. Okay. And Madam Chairman, I just, want, I just want to say one thing too about, um, you know, kind of what you talked about at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, we wanted to thank you for everybody who came along for the, for the plow rides. 
Um, I, I do appreciate on a personal level, and also I know the staff does too, that yes, as, as maybe a little nervous as the drivers were, because, you know, we said we had to have the pep talk with them, make sure, you know, you bring your A game, make sure you, get, you hit those curbs, make sure you're on, you know, we jokingly said that, of course, I never actually spoke to the drivers, but I said to Chris, look, just make sure that, you know, those that are taking the ride, they really get the full experience and, and they see. So the, the plow drivers, yes, we do have 13 new drivers, um, you know, but we also have a lot of experienced season drivers who are helping. Um, you did not go with any of the new drivers, but had you, had you took the ride, took, taken the ride with the new drivers, uh, they, they are trained very well. We had no accidents. Um, they, they really, again, it's a hard job, especially when you're going for 12, 24 hours doing a great yeah, which regulate the amount of salt going through P1, P2, and P3. It's like P3 is like the max blast. Everybody likes to go for the P3, but you know, you know, the, the, the foreman and, and Chris have to tell them to ease up on how much salt you drop down. Uh, again, the municipality does it differently and there's times to go crazy with the salt, but that's not every time. Um, but most importantly too, this morning, I got a, uh, an email that was sent from the mayor from a, from a resident uh, saying that their mailbox got damaged, which does happen. And, and, and they do file a claim and, and those typically are paid out or will replace the box. It's not a big deal um, to replace it, that is. So they also said that, and this is a criticism that we often find is that the plows were flying, the plows were going really fast. So I asked Mr. Tory to pull up the GPS because we have GPS on all our plow trucks uh, now. We, we, we just revamped our um, GPS to, to uh, include a, it's made by at and it's called Fleet Complete. So basically it's like a, a, car, a cartoon when you can log into this database, you can see all the trucks are in real time. Every 30 seconds, it drops what's called the breadcrumb and you can almost see them moving real time like you would on your Waze or your Google Maps. So we do watch that, we do monitor during the storm and that's obviously for liability purposes and, and, and progress. But they, the, the, the person you know, made this statement, they didn't insist on it, but they made the statement that they were flying and, and, and we checked the speeds. And so they were, this driver was uh, in the location three different times in that plow route and the speeds were 20, 24 miles an hour at 10 something in the morning, at once, uh, 10 30 in the morning, one something PM, about 25, 26, and at 340 something, it was maybe 24 miles an hour. So that's less than the 30 mile, 30 mile power speed limit. But oftentimes from the house, it does look like this, the plow drivers are, are going quickly. And I, I knew right off the top of my head, I, I would have been surprised if they were going more than 25 miles an hour. Sometimes that happens when they're decelerating down a curve and at first they're going kind of quick, it might look like that. Or if they have really, or if there's really wet, heavy snow and they're pushing it out and the, the snow is kind of flying out. But the, with the wet, heavy snow, which this was not, Sometimes you have to go a little bit faster than that, 25 miles an hour. But the, just so you know, gen, snow plows are generally ranged in the, you know, in the realm of, of 20 to 30 miles power max. I mean, again, if they're going uphill and it's heavy, wet snow, you might push past that 30 miles power. But, but in general, they live in upper teens to, to mid 20s. That's, that's generally what you should see. Um, but to, uh, Mr. Livingston, to your point, the GPS does, does come into handy because it's, it's things like that that and, and, the, and actually, the resident was ecstatic. They couldn't believe how fast we responded back to them with the information. Uh, we told them how to file a claim, and it was it was it was a very good experience. But they really did appreciate the backup. They didn't question it, and I, and I think that having that GPS is important, and having all that electronics. And it is like a space shuttle in there. I mean, plows back in the day, the the the, the, the floorboards used to be rotted out. Drivers didn't really have heating and air conditioning. It, it was a mess, and, and and you could still see some of those plows in some municipalities. And, and that's what happens when you have an aging non-funded fleet. So, which this is not, by the way, uh, we have almost our entire fleet of 35 plow trucks um, are all almost all max now. Uh, we're just replacing two more we requested this year to replace the old Ford um, L9000s. But anyway, that's a testament to, to, to the common council and to the mayor authorizing those expenditures because if you don't have a good fleet, it, you're, you're, you're dead in the water, especially during a snowstorm. So. Thank you for that. Thank you for the support. Thank you for seeing the operation. And, and for those who didn't see it, for, for appreciating the operation. And a lot of you do text and email and, and call me and my staff during the snow events and, and you know, to thank us and, and to compliment us. And that means a lot after a 24, 36 hour shift when, you know, you see the compliments on Facebook and, and social media and, and you get, you know, a thumbs up from the mayor or from the common council. It, it, it goes along. Those little things go a long way and in my book, but I know my, in my staff's book too. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, do I have a motion? Tom's fire's out. So, yeah. <laughs> well, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go. 
<laughs> okay, gotta go. All right, I think Miss Young uh, was the first to put her hand up. Uh, so the motion to adjourn, all in favor? <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Good night. Right. Good, night. Good night. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Good night. Stay safe. Take care. Good night. Jessica, Jessica I'm going to talk to you. <laughs>